next on Unsolved Mysteries. A traffic accident opens the door to a murder case. The prime suspect is still on the run. Three months after a 16-year-old girl disappears, police get a call from an eyewitness to her abduction. How much does he really know? A young man becomes the innocent victim of a gang shooting, and his parents take the lead in tracking down his killers. And how do you treat an arthritic tiger that has an attitude? You call on Linda Tellington Jones, the therapist with a magic touch. Some hot cases, some cold cases, and some cases with surprising revelations. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Denver, Colorado. At 2 o'clock in the morning, two vehicles collide on a downtown street. One driver flees the scene, leaving his pickup truck. A few minutes later, police arrive. When they search the truck, they find a room key from a local motel and a bloody jack handle. At the motel, police discover the room is registered to Larry Monroe. In his room, they find a pair of pants and a sweatshirt, both covered in blood. It turned out the truck belonged to a man named Donald Smith from Hemet, California. Donald's wife hadn't heard from him for 12 days. What started out as a simple traffic accident would soon turn into a bizarre case of murder. When Don left Hemet, he was headed to Idaho to visit his daughter, Brenda. Except for his two dogs, Don was traveling alone. Brenda was the only child from Don's first marriage. For most of her life, she and her father had been kept apart. My mother kept me away from my father. They didn't get along real well after the divorce. And I think I only saw him like once um, up until the time my mother died. And then I started searching for him. Uh, he was searching for me as well. When Brenda was 26 years old, she and her father were finally reunited. You know, he was very protective of me. And if anyone ever, you know, if I ever had a problem, he said, you know, just let me know, I'll take care of it for you. You know, he was kind of a macho man, I guess. Basically, it was a real good relationship. My father drank, um, which he didn't do very often, you know, thank God. He turned into kind of a different person when he was drunk. The day after Don Smith left home, he and another man pulled up in front of the hospital where Brenda worked as a nurse. Don stayed in the truck while his companion went in. Hi, I'm looking for Brenda Walker. She's not working today. The receptionist referred the man to Brenda's supervisor, John Slane. Yeah, this is John. Slane went outside to talk to Don. Hi, uh, you're Brenda's dad? Yeah, um, wh where's my baby girl, Brenda? Yeah, he was obviously had been drinking. And uh, he said, where's Brenda at? And I said, well, she's on fishing with her girlfriends. The guy that was driving leaned over, you know, to get the directions. Fifteen miles away, Brenda and her two friends had given up fishing and stopped by a tavern near the lake. The door opened, and everyone in the bar turned around. There was a, a black man that had come in, and he closed the door. He had sunglasses on, took the sunglasses off, and uh, looked around for a few minutes. I think he was probably allowing his eyes to adjust to the darkness. Then he walked into the restroom, and 
About probably a minute later, um, this man came in with wild hair and his shirt was untucked. Hi, is there a Brenda Walker in here? Hi, Dad. It took me a minute to really realize who he was. It was my father. He looked so different from the last time I saw him. And he hugged me and sat at the bar with me for a minute. And I realized that he was drunk. And I went into the restroom. I was a little upset because he had showed up drunk and it kind of embarrassed me in front of my friends. She's such a sweetheart. I sure missed her. I went into the restroom. I came back out. Uh -huh. How about you? I want to be with you so much. And he starts crying immediately. And he's babbling and he's talking about how he doesn't want to be alive anymore and how he's got cancer. And he was going to be with my mother in heaven. And then his companion came out of the restroom. Hey. The black man just kept on walking. You know, he kind of looked over at my father and then just kept walking like he didn't really know who he was and went out and got into the truck and got into the driver's seat of my father's truck. I don't know, he looked real impatient, looked disgusted with being there. Yeah, I don't want to hear you cry. I don't want to hear this. Why don't you just go get a motel room sober at and then come back and talk to me tomorrow about it. Anyone want to fight in here? Let's go. Let's go. I can whip anyone in here. When her father became belligerent, Brenda walked out of the saloon. After a few minutes, Don followed Brenda outside, but she left without speaking to him. I wish that I would have had more patience with him. I wish I would have understood his situation. I wish I would have, you know, tried to be more compassionate with him. It was the last time I saw him. He, he opened up the, the camper and let the dogs out and let them run around. And I just drove away. Two weeks later, in the high desert outside Twin Falls, a couple out for their morning walk made a horrifying oh discovery. Police were called in to remove and identify the dead body. We observed a body that appeared to have been thrown over the guardrail, laying down. Uh, the body was decaying for approximately two weeks. We could not recognize him at that point. There was no identification found around him or on him. At this time, we had no idea who we had. We just had another John Doe. An autopsy was done, and we found uh, bludgeon marks on the back of the head, indicating cause of death was by bludgeon. Also outside of the guardrail, where possibly the victim was thrown from, uh, we found a sack with a bottle of wine in it. It was just taken as evidence. The Twin Falls Sheriff's Department had no idea who the body was until they heard about the truck that had been abandoned about 700 miles away in Denver. Denver police had sent out a teletype indicating that they had a vehicle involved in an accident that possibly was involved in a homicide. So I called the Denver uh, Police Department, and they gave me the name of a subject, Donald Smith. Fingerprints positively identified the dead man as Donald Smith. Police began to piece together the events that led up to Don's murder. On the day he left home, he ran into trouble with the trailer that he was towing. Just outside Las Vegas, he arranged to leave it with a local man. One theory is that soon after Don left Las Vegas, he picked up a hitchhiker. At some point along the way, they started drinking. The day after he saw his daughter, Don turned up in Park City, Utah. He called his sister in Vancouver, asking her to wire him $200. When Don picked up the money, he was with someone who looked exactly like the man Brenda had seen with her father in the bar. Police believe that the hitchhiker murdered Don for the money when he stopped to let his dogs out for a run. The murder weapon was probably the jack handle grabbed from the rear of the truck. Ooh. 
I want to know why he killed my father. I want to know why he took my, my father away from me and away from my children. My father was the only family I had. This composite of Don Smith's mysterious companion was made from various eyewitness accounts. He is black, but with relatively light skin. He's about six feet tall and weighs around 180 pounds. Today, he would probably be in his 50s. He may use the name Larry Monroe and might once have lived in Blackfoot, Idaho. If you have any information about this man or the murder of Don Smith, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, police are looking for the eyewitness to the abduction of a young girl. When you think Las Vegas, you think slot machines, blackjack, and high stakes gambling. But just one mile off the strip is another side of Las Vegas, an ordinary part of suburban America. 16 year old Kathy Hobbs is reading a romance novel in her bedroom. At 11 p.m., she decides to walk to the local supermarket just one and a half blocks away to buy another book. She came out to me and she said, Mom, I'm going down to the store and buy a book. And she said, give me a kiss before I go. And I said, why, I'll be up when you get back. And she says, well, she says, I probably will stop and talk to the kids, so you might be in bed when I get back. So I gave her a kiss, and that was the last I saw of her. Kathy often walked to the store late at night. Usually, her friends hung out at the apartment's swimming pool. So Kathy's mother, Vivian, wasn't worried about her. Assuming that Kathy would be with her friends, Vivian went to sleep. Then at 3 a.m., a strange dream woke her up. I woke up out of sound sleep. I felt like I had been hit on the head. And all of a sudden, I got a very peaceful feeling. And it was, well, it's over now and I fell back to sleep. The next morning, Vivian discovered that Kathy's bedroom was empty. Within the first day, we had tracked down friends, uh, relatives, and uh, done a very extensive media campaign on the television with Catherine's picture all day long. At the end of the second day, we were pretty much convinced that uh, Catherine was probably abducted. Kathy's family had been terribly worried about her. As a child, she had frightening premonitions, several of them that she would die at an early age. When she was eight, she became even more specific, telling her friends that she would not live past the age of 16. She did not have a happy childhood. Her father and I went through a divorce when she was eight years old. She and her father were extremely close. When she was in the seventh grade, a very good friend of hers died of a heart disease that affected Kathy very much. And that's one of the main reasons we moved to Las Vegas was to give Kathy another chance to get away from that atmosphere and the environment that she grew up in. After the move, Kathy blossomed and made new friends. But as her 16th birthday approached, her old fear of dying returned. She got very teary-eyed one night and told me, Mom, I don't want to get any older. I want to be a little girl. And I told her, I said, Kathy, we all have to grow up. And you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but we all do it. She told me, I'm not going to. She didn't think she'd make her 16th birthday. Kathy spent all of her time in her room and would not leave the house. And then, on the morning of her 16th birthday, she was surprised and relieved to find that she was still alive. And she came out of her bedroom, and she said, Mom, I did it, I did it, I made it. And I said, what? And she said, I made 16. I didn't think I'd live to be 16. Kathy now seemed to have a new enthusiasm for life. 
she began to go out again and started making plans for her future. She was ecstatic. She came out, she goes, I made it, Mom. I made it. I'm 16. I did it. I'm alive. After Kathy vanished, police assumed that she had been abducted and issued photos to the media. Eventually, one crucial clue surfaced. A clerk remembered seeing Kathy in the supermarket the night she vanished. Store receipts confirmed that someone did purchase a paperback novel at 11.17 that night. Apparently, Kathy had made it to the store, but not home. This intersection is a large intersection, uh, widely traveled, and the store is a 24-hour major store. And to have people coming and going from the store and nobody seeing anything was very, very surprising. Nine days after Kathy vanished, a hiker was searching for rock crystals out in the desert near Lake Mead. Was walking back to the car and was probably 150 feet, 200 feet from the road and was stopped by a very strong odor. Decided to see where it was coming from or what it was. And that's when I found Catherine's body. It was the most horrible thing I'd ever seen in my life. I had to sit down and, and gather my thoughts and, and make sure that what I was looking at was real. Within probably 20 minutes of our arrival, we knew it was Catherine. There was no doubt in our own minds that it was going to be Catherine. And it does get very quiet. And uh, you can't help but look at it and see your own children and say, for the grace of God, there goes one of mine. You want to run home, grab your daughter by the arm, and bring her to the scene and say, this is why I say, no, you can't go out late at night. Tire prints at the scene showed where a vehicle had pulled in, turned around, and left. Investigators also found two rocks spattered with Kathy's blood. The coroner concluded that she died from repeated blows to the head. She was 16 years, three months, and three days old when she was killed. So she made it to 16, but uh, not much after that. But she was right, you know. She did have this premonition that she wasn't going to live to be an adult. After Kathy's death, letters were found in her room addressed to each member of the family. They were dated one month before her 16th birthday. Dear Mother, in event of my death, you shall get this letter. I hope you live happily, and I don't want you or anyone else to dwell on my death. I love you all very dearly. You are good to me, and nobody else could have been a better mother. Keep me alive in your heart, and don't ever forget me. Love always, Kathy. Exactly three months after Kathy vanished, a call came in to the Las Vegas Police Department. Their answering machine recorded this message from a man who may have witnessed her abduction. Grab this girl in front of the uh, uh, store on Desertine in Maryland. This is a few months ago. I've been out of town for a few months, and I wrote this down because she was screaming, and they pulled her in the car. She's a very young girl wearing a white uh, jacket and the pink pants. And the guy's name, he hollered to him, push her in the car, and his name was Robbie. The theory that we have is that she was abducted uh, between the store and her apartment uh, by one or more suspects. Uh, we think she was driven to the lake that night. I believe that she was abducted and killed that evening. The caller reported the license number of the car, but did not leave his name or phone number. The police checked the license number and discovered it did not exist. And the witness still has not called back. Today, the murder of Kathy Hobbs remains unsolved. Her mother and the Las Vegas police hope that the witness will call back and give more details, or that someone watching may recognize the voice of the mysterious caller. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. 
While the witness never contacted authorities and was never located, this case has been closed. An alleged serial killer named Michael Lee Lockhart was a key suspect in Kathy's murder. After his arrest for another murder, he was put on trial, convicted, and has since been executed. Next, how can the touch of a human hand ease the pain of a suffering tiger? This woman has the answer. Keiko, the killer whale, escaped to the open sea in the film Free Willy. But in real life, Keiko suffered from a strange wart-like growth called a papilloma beneath his pectoral fins. For 10 years, no one was able to cure it. Then, Linda Tellington Jones came along with a technique she calls the tea touch. When I was asked to work with Keiko with the touches, I really didn't know if it would help him or not. What I was hoping is that these little circular touches would actually affect the cells and help to reduce the effects of this virus-like papilloma. Keiko's handlers saw results almost immediately. The day after Linda was with Keiko, we, we saw big changes on the papilloma. Um, it was very thin and it, it wasn't broken as always is. So he was active also, he was like kind of very happy. Linda next tried her hand at the Out of Africa Wildlife Park in Phoenix, Arizona. A 400 pound Bengal tiger named Kipling had joints that were inflamed and very painful. Linda was convinced that she would be able to help by the T-Touch, her own system of therapeutic touching. They're a collection of circular touches done all over the body with the idea, with the intent of waking up the functioning of the cells. To make the connection, I did the big circles and say, feel you, feel you. And then when I really went into the joints, it's this very directed connection so that he really feels the intent of waking up those cells. It's like turning on the electric lights of the body. It seemed to calm him down and his body relaxed and his breathing came heavier. Um, so he was going into a, a deep, uh, relaxed state by her touch. When she got to a point where it was obvious he, his joints hurt him, he reacted, but not violently in any way. So now we know where to touch and where he really needs it, just from, from what she did with that, that session with him. The Siberian tiger named Genesis offered the most dangerous test for Linda's T-Touch therapy. Genesis had been known to attack anyone within reach, even the handlers he had known for years. He has attacked me. I have a personal experience with Genesis where he actually went through my arm and uh, way into my arm. It was much too risky for Linda to go inside the tiger's enclosure. From outside, she guided Bobby in performing the tea touch while another handler kept Genesis calm by letting him lick her fingers. Um, if there's a way you can keep him sucking and you reach back and you can yeah, get to the neck and shoulders and at least- T touched seemed to be working. Genesis hadn't attacked anyone yet. Keep the primary contact with the hand where he feels safe up on the shoulder and the other one just kind of moves back. And up there along- What we find is that the touches override fear or aggression. Those are instinctive responses. And that when we do these little circular touches all over the body, you can take an animal who is very fearful or an animal who is aggressive, and suddenly you change them at a core level, at the level of the brain. As a skeptic, you know, I don't, I don't understand part of her philosophy of... Dr. Irvin Ingram, a Phoenix veterinarian, had treated Genesis several times. Though he had doubts about T-Touch therapy, Ingram watched with an open mind. In the end, he concluded that Linda 
had made an impact. Quietly around the base of the ear, so each side. Something certainly made a difference, and she's the primary difference, I guess, today, but there's no question from this morning to this afternoon, much calmer. Seems almost aware of what's around him instead of being in his own little world. I don't know why it works. I don't really know how it works. We only know from experience in six continents with incredible numbers of animals and people that it does work, but it's a mystery. There are more than 1,300 practitioners of the Tellington Method in 26 countries. Linda has written over a dozen books that have been published in different languages. She was recently inducted into the Massage Therapy Hall of Fame. Next, it was only a childhood promise made during a brief hospital stay. Decades later, the girl who made that promise was finally able to keep it. When she was just seven years old, Nikki Crowder was in a hospital in Los Angeles to have several tumors removed from her throat. That's where she met eight-year-old Sharita Lynn Harding who had a very rare and a very dangerous form of cancer. I looked up to Sharita because, one, she was older, and she was there first. So she kind of initiated me of what, you know, being in a new place, new atmosphere. The two girls became close friends overnight. There was a bond there because we mattered to one another. We looked out for what went, you know, went on. And we had something in common, and that was our illnesses itself. A few weeks after they met, Sharita went through several hours of grueling surgery. Mom, is this going to happen to me? No, honey, this isn't going to happen. So that's when my mother explained to me that Sharita had had a very, very delicate surgery and that she wouldn't be able to have kids. And I remember feeling like, oh, that, you know, was just the worst thing in the world. That night, Nikki did her best to comfort her friend. I'm sorry you're feeling so bad. Does it hurt? I said, you don't have to cry because if I ever have a baby, I said, you can share it with me and we can both be its mommy. I said, and I'll even name it. Sharita, after you. After five weeks, Nikki was released from the hospital. The two friends never saw each other again. More than 20 years later, Nikki wanted to find her old friends so she could be godmother for the christening of Nikki's three-year-old daughter, who she named Sharita in honor of her friend. I promise. Update. A few minutes after we first broadcast Nikki's story, we learned that Sharita Lynn Harding was alive and well and living in Oklahoma. 21 years after they said goodbye, the two friends were reunited at Nikki's home in Los Angeles. Oh, I can't believe it. It's been a long time. 20 I'm so glad to see you. Hi. I'm so glad you're alive. I don't think Nikki has changed that much. She was always caring, giving person. It seems like she's still the same. She would have to be to try to find me in you know, all these years and be so persistent about it. Nikki was finally able to keep her promise. Protect her. All the child is it's, it's a gift you can't buy. It's the most perfect gift in the world. And it comes from God. And Nobody should be deprived of that, whether they have it naturally or can share it with somebody. And that's something that I wanted to share with Sharita. Because of all the joy and strength she, you know, she gave me, I could give her back something that she missed. Lord, bless them, even as godparents. Call Being a spirit. godmother is special to me because I don't have any kids. And, and uh, it's given me like a child of my own that I you know, can share. I'm just honored, and so I'll try to live up to it as best as I can. 
I christened thee Sharita Kennedy Crowder. Nearly 400,000 Americans are victims of gang violence each year. Many are innocent bystanders caught in the crossfire who don't even belong to a gang. Victims like Kevin Wheel. Hawaiian Gardens, California, just south of Los Angeles. It was here that Teresa Wheel's only son, Kevin, was gunned down by four suspected gang members. Kevin was what you might say a typical teenager. He loved his music really loud. He was a little bit on the shy side. He had a sense of humor you wouldn't believe. And he always, always had a smile on his face. Hawaiian Gardens had its share of gang activity, and Kevin knew several gang members. It was a casual association that proved fatal. On the night that he was killed, Kevin spent the evening at a friend's house. He was driving home around 11.30 p.m. when, according to eyewitnesses, a car began to follow him. Kevin was struck twice in the head and three times in the back. An hour later, he was dead. Police immediately suspected it was a gang shooting. Some of Kevin's friends were Hawaiian Gardens gang members, but that doesn't mean that Kevin was a gang member. He just associated with them, and I feel the other gang recognized the car, and they just keyed on the car and not the occupants of the vehicle. I didn't want Kevin's case to be just another gang-related shooting. I didn't want it to be another shooting that went unsolved. I made a promise that I would do everything in my power to catch these guys who murdered him. Kevin's parents would not sit still. They posted thousands of flyers around the area where he was shot. When the investigation first started, I thought, you know, there was so much information at first that this probably wouldn't be no problem. And being that Kevin wasn't a gang member, you know, people would talk. But I was really wrong. Gang shooting investigations are very frustrating. Within the gang culture, the reason the uh, witnesses are not coming forward is because they feel that, that being a snitch is worse than death itself. Maybe it'll get these guys. I hope so. The hardest part for Stan and I right now is, I think, dealing with the anger. The anger that our son is dead and buried in a grave at 19. There was no rhyme or reason why anybody would want to shoot Kevin. He's never been in any fights or disagreements with anybody. I mean, he was just you know, 19-year-old out having fun. It was just so senseless, it's so stupid. It was and still is such a shock that something like this could happen. Police believe Kevin's killers were four males, possibly Hispanic. They were driving a white compact car and may have been members of a gang based in nearby Artesia. If you have any information about the murder of Kevin Wheel, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, a woman is convinced that she's been contacted from beyond the grave by the spirit of her daughter. The death of a family member is one of the most difficult experiences any of us will ever face. So it's not surprising that many people wish that they could somehow speak with a lost loved one. In our next story, we'll meet a woman who believes that she got that chance after the death of her daughter. Karen Walker was the only child of Jean and Tom Walker. 
Karen was very bright, read extensively uh, from the time she was about three. I no longer had to read to her. She would read the stories to me instead, which was wonderful. There was one story that symbolized the closeness Karen and her parents felt for each other. The Three Musketeers. The familiar phrase, all for one, one for all, became the Walker family motto. When Karen was 17, the family circle expanded to include her new boyfriend, Jim Alvarado. Karen and Jim seemed an unlikely match. Jim came from a large working class family. He was a poor student who had been told that he would never amount to much, but Karen knew better. She saw something in me in terms of, of potential as far as my intellect was concerned. She didn't know, you know, what I lacked necessarily in academic skills. Although over that period of time in study hall, she began to, to learn, and she began to help me even then. The clause may be renaming the subject. When Jim's mind would wander, Karen had her own special way of getting him back on track. Pay attention. Oh, was that You're for? not going to get into college this way. And she would get my attention, and, and I would straighten up and... And, and get back to work and, and do what I had to do. She was my tutor, she was my helper, she was my friend, and somebody who I loved very, very much. Karen was only 20 when tragedy struck. The cause of a lingering pain in her right leg was finally diagnosed. Karen had Ewing sarcoma, a rare and usually fatal form of cancer. We reacted with horror, but with determination. We were going to see to it that she got well. The three musketeers were going to stay together. Karen began an exhaustive series of radiation and chemotherapy treatments. Oh, hello. Hello. After two months of treatment, Karen suffered a painful setback. Karen woke up about 5 o'clock in the morning pain in her leg for the first time in a long time. She had been going through cobalt therapy and the pain had disappeared. And suddenly the pain was excruciating. That's what My I leg, said. it hurts, it hurts. Oh, okay. can't move it. The cancer had eaten the bone completely through. The bone was no longer there. Through it all, Karen's spirits remained strong and hopeful. In March, Jim proposed and they started to plan their wedding. But only 12 days before the ceremony, Karen lapsed into a coma. Remember what we used to say about the Three Musketeers, how we'd always stick together? Huh? One for all and all for one? I learned that the tumor had gone into the brain. I knew we had reached the end. She woke up in the middle of the night, and I held her hand and asked her how she was, because that was the first time she had talked to me in nine days. Mom, it's time. I can't go on like this anymore. I can't think anymore. I understand. Is it OK? Of course. Please, tell Dad. Tell Jim that it was my decision that I was ready to go. I will, I promise. And as I was watching, something went out of the top of her head. It just lifted. And it was like a wisp of smoke or, or fog or something. And as I saw that happen, I said, goodbye, Karen. Karen died on December 17th two days before she would have been married. The night after Karen died, Jim stayed at her parents' house. He tried to study and keep from thinking about his enormous loss. But Jim was about to get his first hint that Karen's spirit had survived death. It was more than a kick. It was really an awakening on my part that got my attention. And I realized that at that point that, you know, Karen was, was with me at that point. Karen's parents, Tom and Jean, were also searching for comfort. 
Over the next few days, they went to psychics and mediums, hoping they might contact Karen's spirit. Three times they tried, and three times the walkers went away disappointed. Then they went to see a medium Jean had read about, the Reverend George Daisley. Jean and Tom agreed to limit the information they gave the Reverend. They only told him that their daughter had recently died, but they did not give him Karen's name. I knew they were grieving parents. I knew nothing about them whatsoever otherwise. Nothing whatsoever. Daisley's first comments amazed the walkers. I will tell you everything that she says. Your daughter is here. She is safe. She is well. She says she doesn't hurt anymore. She wants me to tell you that you were the three musketeers and you still are. She says, we are the three musketeers and we'll always be together. I was just flabbergasted that people could come up with the one piece of information that was so specific to us. I think if he had said nothing else that day, I would always, always know that Karen was still alive. I'm hearing the name Karen. Yes, yes, it's Karen. It's her birthday soon. I believe, yes. The details Daniel literally spilled out of Reverend Daisley. The Three Musketeers, Karen's name, her birthday, even detailed descriptions of two photographs taken when Karen was just a child. We went home smiling and crying. But there was always, from then on, there was that underlying current of, I know she's OK. According to Jean, Karen eventually began to communicate without the help of a medium and later guided her to write this book, Always Karen. It describes Karen's struggle with cancer, her death, and her firsthand views of life beyond this one.